Welcome back to Franklin Covey's twice weekly leadership podcast on leadership with Scott Miller in our sixth year, 350 plus interviews recorded where we have had the privilege for weeks and weeks on end all through the pandemic, never skipping a week on Tuesdays, now and Fridays, we release episodes where we take Franklin Covey's global platform and shine it not only on our own internal authors and thought leaders that are obviously consequential in the 60 million books that we have sold across our numerous titles, many of which you are adopting those solutions in your organizations to develop leaders, but also to take this spotlight and as a good steward of our co-founder, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, who popularized the concept of having an abundance mentality versus a scarcity mindset. We try to lift other voices up that we think share similar values and help to shepherd our mission, which is to inspire greatness in people and organizations everywhere. I am delighted to have the phenom uh, opinion writer, columnist, interviewee, interviewer. You know him as David Brooks. He is a contributor to the New York Times, to the Atlantic. You probably recognize his mug from his frequent appearances on PBS NewsHour. He is a multi-best-selling author, and today he has written what I think is his most consequential contribution as an author. Uh, I've told you in previous openings that I have no credibility when it comes to restaurant recommendations or movie recommendations, but having read, you know, eight, 10,000 books over the course of my career, this book is a book you need to own. If you are a human, you need to buy How to Know a Person, David's most recent release, which is why it has become a bestseller since its release several weeks ago. His book is titled How to Know a Person, The Art of seeing others deeply and being deeply seen. David Brooks, welcome to On Leadership. Oh, I'm honored and privileged to be here. Thank you very much. I told you, I told you that I've had the privilege in the last six years of literally interviewing every pop icon, NFL, NBA star, celebrity, thought leader. And up until I announced on my Instagram that you were coming, my father-in-law was a little ho-hum. But he thinks I'm finally legit now that I have David Brooks in the Franklin Covey house. So I appreciate you investing in our listeners and viewers today, including my relationship with my father-in-law prior to the holidays. <laughs> uh, actually, he and I love each other uh, very deeply. David, this book is seminal. It's not a word I use very often in 350 interviews. I want to repeat the title and the tagline. How to Know a Person the art of seeing others deeply and being deeply seen. David, you are a well-respected um, opiner of all things geopolitical, economic, cultural, societal. Why of all the topics you could have written about now, was this the focus of your most recent bestseller? Yeah, I guess there's a personal reason and then there's a social reason. And the personal reason, I start the book by saying, if you uh, ever saw that movie, Fiddler on the Roof, you know how warm and huggy Jewish families can be. They're always singing and dancing. Well, I come from the other kind of Jewish family. Uh, the culture in my household was act Yiddish, think British. So we were super emotionally reserved. Uh, and so I was not a, I was a particular stranger to, I was, I was a stranger to my emotions, uh, to feelings, I think if you had met me 10 years ago, I would not have been the kind of person uh, you would have reached out to who would have been vulnerable. I was not great at intimacy, uh, not so great at friendship. And there's one story that symbolizes for me that mode of life. I love baseball. I've been to a thousand baseball games, never caught a foul ball. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting in Baltimore about 12 years ago with my youngest son, and the batter loses control of the bat, and it lands at my feet. And I have a bat. Now, getting a bat is a thousand times better than getting a ball. And so any normal human being is hit, hoisting his trophy in the air, high-fiving everybody, hugging everybody, getting on the jumbotron. I just put the bat at my feet and stare straight ahead. I have the emotional reaction of a turtle, basically. Uh, and so I look back on that guy and I think, you know, show a little joy. And so I decided if I was going to become a full human being, I was going to have to get better at emotions better at social connection, better at intimacy, better at vulnerability, and really change. And so I've embarked on a journey over the last 10 or 15 years, and it sort of worked, uh, and I can prove it, but I have to do a little name dropping. Um, and so I've been on Oprah twice, and I've been interviewed by Oprah twice, the second time in 2019. And after the second interview, she says to me, 
Uh, David, you were so emotionally blocked before. I've rarely seen somebody change so much in middle age. Uh, and so that was a good moment for me, a, a sign you can change. And so this book is really me trying to learn how to better connect with people, how to do the basic skills of listening well, of conversing well, disagreeing well, how to offer criticism in a caring way, uh, how to ask for and offer forgiveness, how to host a meeting so everybody feels included. I just wanted to learn the basic skills. And so a lot of us writers, are we're working out our stuff in public. Uh, and if I can find something that I found useful for me, I'm, I love passing it along. And that's, that's the personal reason I wrote the book. Perhaps no one better alive to write this book than you. Uh, ironically, the book could have been titled How to Become a Full Human Being. It's almost a guide to how to be a human being in 2023, 2024, and beyond, how to be a friend, how to be a parent, how to be a leader, how to be a coach, how to be a human. David, when I bought your book uh, about 10 days ago, I was carrying it around with me as I do most of the books for interviews, and I read them at uh, my boys' uh, basketball games and their tennis lessons. I read snippets in you know, car parking lots, and when I opened your book, uh, I saw in very small, discreet print on a single page opposite the copyright and the perfunctory publishing information, you wrote two Peter Marks in very small, elegant writing. I had no idea who Peter Marks was. I immediately thought, you know what? I had to Google who Peter Marks is. Perhaps it's his publicist or his agent or childhood best friend. In fact, Peter Marks is your childhood best friend. And not until about almost halfway through the book do I think you really introduce Peter in an extraordinarily vulnerable in touching chapter. Now, I'll tell, to, I'll tell you this to our listeners and viewers. The one piece of advice I give to all of our guests is I say, hey, don't prolong a story. Don't give me a 17-minute answer. But today, David, I invite you to give me a 17-minute answer because the story you tell about your friend Peter Marks is so important because every one of us either has Peter in our life or we are Peter and no one knows it, and I'd like you to belabor that story, both who he was, why he was so important to you, the journey he was on, what happened, and then we'll maybe dive deep into how do we, how do we approach that in our own lives? Yeah, so I mentioned that a lot of what I was suffering from is a lack of skill. And you know the ability to see other people and to manage other people is partly about being open-hearted. You've gotta be open-hearted. But partly it's about skills. Uh, you've just got to know what to say at the right time and what to do and what not to say. And so the story of Pete is a, a story of me learning skills in a certain circumstance. So Pete was my oldest friend and my best friend in childhood. We met when we were 11. And we played everything together. We played a ton of basketball. We played tennis. We played softball. We could turn anything into a form of play. Like we ate as if we were playing, like just smacking our lips and delighting over the food and making fun of each other. And so Pete was, um, my wife had said it best about Pete. He was ordinary and extraordinary at the same time. He was a man, but the way you're supposed to be a man with both strength and gentleness. He was a father, but the way you're supposed to be a father with great pride and joy and playfulness with his sons. And he had a great life. He, he was a surgeon. Uh, and at age 57, uh, he got hit with depression. Uh, very severe depression. And my no wife noticed it immediately when we saw him one spring day and that light had gone out of his eyes. And so I thought I'm a reasonably well-educated guy. I know what I'm, I know about the world. I probably know about depression. I've read books about it and stuff like that. But I learned I didn't really know what depression was. And I learned if you're lucky enough to not to have suffered from it, then you can't understand it by extrapolating from your own moments of sadness. And what depression is, another friend of mine described it as a malfunction in the instrument we use to perceive reality. That a person in, dep in depression is seeing a different reality and basically seeing a false reality. And in Pete's case, he had the, these obsessive voices in his head that were lying to him, that were saying, you're worthless, you're worthless, nobody would miss you if you were gone. And so it caused him uh, uncountable grief and pain. And so I was unskilled and had to sit with a friend who was suffering from depression. Uh, and so I made some of the mistakes that are common. The first one, I tried to give him ideas on how to make the depression lift. And so I said to him, you know, you, um, uh, you used to go on these service trips to Vietnam. You found them so rewarding. Why don't you do that? And I later learned if you're giving a depressed person ideas to, about how to make depression lift, you're just showing you don't get it. 
because it's not ideas they're lacking. It's lack of energy, it's lack of a lot of other things, but it's not ideas. The second mistake I made was I said, uh, I tried to cheer them up. I said, look at all the wonderful things in your life. You have a great career, uh, you have a wonderful marriage, your two boys are amazing. And what I learned then, that I was only making him feel worse. If you're telling the depressed person uh, that they should be enjoying the things they're palpably not enjoying, you're just making them feel worse. And so those were common mistakes I made because I was unskilled in this circumstance. Gradually over the three years he had depression, I learned uh, a few things. The first thing you can do is acknowledge the reality of the situation. And that is to say, this sucks, this really sucks. And then to ask, like, what does it feel like? What are you going through? I want to know what you're going through. And that's a way of making the depressed person feel a little less isolated, which is how they're prone to feeling when their mind is, is it, inhabiting its own reality. So acknowledge the reality of the situation. The second thing is to just a burst of goodwill. I want more for you. I want more for you. And that won't cure anything, but at least you're saying, I have goodwill toward you. I have positive regard for you. And the third thing uh, you can do is constant touches, a text here, a call there, a postcard somewhere else. It's just a constant way of saying to the person, you're on my mind, I'm thinking of you, uh, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not, I'm not gonna abandon you, I'm, I'm just gonna be here. And I wish I'd done more of that. Uh, with Pete, because they, they, I think they, a lot of people who are suffering depression fear that their friends are just going to say, such a drag being around this person, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. But just to reassure them uh, that you're not going anywhere. And then the fourth thing you can do, I learned this from Viktor Frankl, who wrote a great book called Man's Search for Meaning, about, and he learned about life in the Nazi death camps. And he, he says when he uh, was confronting and counseling somebody who was contemplating suicide in the death camps, he would say to them, Life has not stopped expecting things of you. Life has not stopped expecting things of you. And when I first read that, it sounded kind of harsh. But I trust Frankel to know what he's talking about. That because of your pain, because of what you're endured, you have the credibility and your low voice will tremble in the hearts of others who are enduring pain of their own. Uh, and there's a great Thornton Wilder sentence, in love service, only wounded soldiers can serve. And so those who've been through pain and endured, they have power. And so life has not stopped expecting things. You have responsibilities to the world. Now, nothing I said or could have said, I don't think, would have made any difference. And Pete ended up, after three years, um, succumbing to depression, succumbing to suicide. And as I say, I don't think anything I could have said would have altered that final outcome. Uh, the beast was bigger than Pete. It was going to be bigger than me. It was certainly going to be bigger than a bunch of words. But I think I could have shown up more gracefully, and I wish I'd, I'd known then what I know now about how, to, how just to accompany anybody through this awful disease. And I will say that, as you said, everybody, almost everybody has this in their life. Uh, I was at, in Oklahoma giving a talk, and the, it's one of those talks where the questions are on index cards, they come up to you in index cards, and most of the questions are about politics or something. And I turn over one index card, and it's a handwritten, card and it says, what do you do if you no longer want to be alive? And back then I didn't know what to say. So I, to my shame, I didn't say anything. I went home and told this story at dinner. Uh, and a young woman who was visiting us said, you know, my brother committed suicide three months ago. I told it to a group call I'm on about 14 people and about eight or 10 had suicide or depression in their family and in their life. And so it's just pervasive. And it, it, I just, we just need to teach the skills of how to just a company want someone through uh, this awful condition. David, that was both beautifully and um, delicately delivered. Let's if, take a deeper dive. Uh, I know you're not a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a mental health therapist. Um, any other advice on how you sit with someone through suffering? And that may be suffering from a different type of illness or a job loss or a marital loss or the, you know, a child that has, you know, you know, adolescent tendencies and is driving you batty. It doesn't have to be a life-ending issue. Anything else you've learned that all of us could kind of lean in and listen? If we've got someone suffering in our life, how do we sit with them and help? Yeah, well, as you're talking, I'm reminded of a story I heard from, I read about from a guy named Rabbi Elliot Kukla. And he, he said one of his congregants was, um, had a brain injury. 
uh, and she, uh, she would sometimes just collapse to the floor. She would just fall on the floor. And she said, she reported to him that when she falls on the floor, people rush to help her up uh, immediately. And she said, I think they rush to help me up because they're so uncomfortable seeing an adult on the ground. But what I really need at that moment is for somebody to get down on the floor with me. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's, that's empathy. It's not doing what makes you comfortable. It's doing what makes the other person comfortable, which is sometimes you just get down on the floor with the person and you just sit there with them on the floor. And I use that literally and I always use that metaphorically. Just stay in their experience. The second thing I think I've learned is that when something terrible happens, the loss of a loved one uh, the, or any th horrible loss, your mind has to readjust its models. You've suffered an attack. You've suffered some abuse. And the way you fail at adjusting to the new world, the way post-traumatic trauma happens, is that people don't adjust their models. They take the old models of their life and they just try to assimilate the trauma into their old models, their old mindset. And that's a surefire way to not grow. But some people experience what they call post-traumatic growth. Uh, they, um, they, they become better persons. Uh, and those people don't assimilate what happened into their existing models. They create new models. They say that my old life is not ha happening anymore. I am now a cancer survivor. This changes how I see the world. I've lost a daughter. This changes how I see the world. Uh, and so I think it's those helping people. You know, they, the process of grief is really the process of readjusting your models. I was out to lunch not long ago with a friend, and his wife died not long ago. And after lunch, he said, we had had a great conversation. He said, you know, I can't wait to tell Denise about this. And then he realized that was never going to happen. And so he, hadn't, he was still in the process of readjusting his models to his new reality. And then finally, when we're in our own period of suffering, I, I've been helped by a phrase from the 1950s theologian Paul Tillich. And he says, moments of suffering interrupt your life, and they remind you you're not the person you thought you were. He writes, they carve through the floor of what you thought was the basement of your soul and reveal a cavity below. And then they carve through the floor and reveal a cavity below. So in those moments of suffering, you just see deeper into yourself than you ever saw before. And at the same time, you're kind of unstable. And so I think the rule is people are either broken by suffering or they're broken open. Either they cover themselves over so they're unable to be hurt or touched or felt. They just close in their heart or they're broken open. They, uh, they become even more vulnerable. They became, become more open to people. They realize that those cavities in their soul uh, will only be fed with spiritual and relational food. And so they, they cast aside some of the career obsessions they used to have, and they just want to become a better lover, friend, spouse, uh, parent, whatever. They, they get relational. And I think that's people who get broken open by suffering. Thank you, David. Uh, one of the concepts that we teach at Franklin Covey to our clients all around the world is that you know, people are not an organization's most valuable asset. It's, it's cliche, it's great to hear, but what is every company's organization, school district, church, community, what their most valuable asset is in fact are the relationships between their people. It's how people get along, they forgive each other, they pre-forgive each other, they complement each other. That Every one of us as leaders or individual contributors are in the business of developing relationships with our customers, our clients, our vendors, our stakeholders. In many cases are even our competitors because you may go to work there someday or merge or you know, have an acquisition. To the extent we both believe that everyone needs to develop better relationship skills. Some of us are introverts, some of us are extroverts, some of us are uncomfortable with silence. Some of us don't know how to get down on the floor. And for us, we have to stand you up immediately so we're comfortable. That actually spoke to me deeply. Will you just give us some insights of what you've learned in life around how to be better at developing relationships? What kind of questions to ask? When to be comfortable with silence? What kind of questions not to ask? Take that anywhere you'd like to go. Yeah, so, you know, um, the book is subtitled How to See Others Deeply and Be Deeply Seen. And I gave it that subtitle um, because I want people to understand what I was talking about. But it would be more accurate to say the art of hearing others deeply and being deeply heard. Because the act of building a relationship is really the art of conversation. It's being just really good at conversation. And most of us are not good. 
So there's a researcher who uh, at the University of Texas who studies people who are in early in conversation. He, he, he tries to figure out how well do they understand what's going on in the other person's mind. And the average person gets it right only 20% of the time. Some people are pretty good 55% of the time. Some people are 0% of the time. They have no idea what's going on in the other person's mind, but they think they're at 100%. And that can be ruinous for companies, among other things. Uh, there was a McKinsey study. They asked uh, CEOs, why do people leave your firm? And the number one answer the CEOs gave was, people leave my firm because they want to make money, better money somewhere else. Then they asked the people who left the firm, why did they leave? And the number one answer was, my manager doesn't recognize me. They didn't feel seen. And so these, this inability to have great conversations is expensive and damaging to organizations. And so how do you become a better conversationalist? And so I asked over four years, a bunch of conversation experts, how do you do this? And they gave me some tips and there are a bunch in the book, but I'll share just a few. One is treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. Uh, that if you're gonna be in conversation with somebody, make it 100% or 0%, don't try to 60% it. Second, be a loud listener. I have a buddy, when you talk to him, it's like talking to a Pentecostal church, one of those charismatic churches. He's like, yes, 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 I'm, I agree. Preach that, preach that, I'm in. Love talking to that guy. Another is make as many of your conversations storytelling conversations as you can. Uh, so when I'm, even as a political journalist, I no longer ask people, uh, what do you believe about that? I ask, how did you come to believe that? And then they're telling me a story about a person who had influence on their values or some experience they had. You want to get people into storytelling mode. And when people are telling you stories, they're not going to enough detail. So if you say, where was your boss when she said that? Uh, where was she sitting? And suddenly they're back in the scene and they're narrating the scene to you. And you get a much richer version of themselves and the, what they're talking about. And then finally, uh, don't be a topper. If you tell me, you know, I had this horrible flight last week and I, we were stuck on the tarmac for two hours, and then I say, oh, I know exactly where you're going through. I had a horrible flight. We were stuck on the tarmac for four hours. It sounds like I'm just trying to relate, but what I'm really doing is saying, let's stop talking about you and let's talk about me. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm saying, and by the way, my experiences are more awesome than yours. And so that's kind of selfish. So don't be a topper. So uh, there, there are plenty in the book, but those are just a few of the conversational tips that'll get you better at conversation and then therefore better at relationship. David, the humans that are the best at seeing others, what do they have in common? They do what? Yeah, I make this distinction in the book between diminishers and illuminators. And so diminishers um, are not curious about you. They stereotype, they ignore, they do a thing called stacking which is if they, uh, if they learn one fact about you, they make a whole series of assumptions about you. If you're a Trump supporter, you must be this, 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 and this. And people are never as simplistic as their stereotypes. So that's what diminishers do. And I find I often leave a party and I think, you know, that whole time nobody asked me a question. And I find that only about 30% of the people I know are question askers. The rest are perfectly nice people. They're just not that curious about other people. Illuminators, on the other hand, are curious. And they make you feel respected, lit up. They make you feel like they see the world a, lit, a little bit from your point of view. And so there was a novelist uh, named Ian Forster who wrote like a century ago or so or a little more. Uh, and his biographer wrote of him, to be, encounter him was to be seduced by an inverse charisma. To be listened to with such intensity, you had to be your sharpest, most honest, and best self. We all want to be able to listen like that. Another story I tell is about Bell Labs. And so there was a, 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 there were some, a lot of, obviously a lot of researchers there, but some of them were way more productive and creative than others. And the patent lawyers wanted to figure out why are some of our researchers so much more innovative than others? And they checked their educational background, they checked their IQ, they couldn't figure it out. And then they realized that the most productive researchers were in the habit of having breakfast or lunch with an electrical engineer named Harry Nyquist. And Nyquist would ask them about their challenges, he would get inside their head, and he would help them think through their problems, and he made them more productive and innovative. So Harry Nyquist was an illuminator. And so the key trait that um, illuminators have is the ability to see the world from another's point of view. But what a person is is a point of view. Each of us has taken the experiences of our lives, the hurts of our lives, the joys of our lives, the teachers in our lives, and we've created our unique, never-to-be-replicated own way of seeing the world. 
and it's going to be very different one from another. But an illuminator has the ability to ask you questions and say, "Where? How do you see that? How do you think? How do you think about this?" And they begin to have a model of how you see the world. And even if it's just a little bit, they make you feel just tremendous. I, I remember a book review I had in 2000. I haven't thought about this in a while. By a woman named Diana Schaub, who teaches at Johns Hopkins. And her book review of one of my books had some criticism in it, but she understood what I was trying to do. She understood my goals and my motivations and why I made the choices I did. Uh, and I felt so honored by that review. It's been 23 years and I still remember that review, but it's just so honoring to somebody. To, and I've spent you know, the last four years, tell me about a time you felt seen. And people's eyes light up and they recount times that changed their lives when mm -hmm. somebody got them. Yeah. As you're saying that, I can think of an instance when the former CEO and now chairman of our company, Franklin Covey, once said something to me that was a consequential contribution I had made in the company, like eight years prior. And I didn't even know he recognized it or knew it, and he actually shared it in an executive team meeting, and then he said, and because of that, we did this, and because of that, we were able to do this, and it was probably the most seen I'd ever felt in a 30-year career, recognizing that the CEO knew my contribution, but also tied it to results and a cultural change. I just now thought of that. Uh, superb advice. David, like there are diminishers and illuminators, there are dividers and healers. There are unifiers and there are polarizers. Without taking our conversation political, what's the state of our country and the world, it seems like in America, you're either over here or you're over there. And I don't know if that's true or not. I think maybe uh, the media sources thrive on polarizing us. Are we closer than we think we are? What would you say about taking the concept of diminishers and illuminators and also applying it to uniters and dividers? Yeah, well, we have a lot of conflict entrepreneurs in this country and they make money off conflict. Uh, and they are doing a pretty effective job. And one of the things they do is they divide people into, into polar categories. So you're either red or blue, you're either, um, you're either a colonizer or a colonized, you're either an oppressor or an oppressed, uh, but you're not a person, you're just a member of a group. Uh, and once you give people an us, them categories, they will become vicious. And we have a lot of viciousness that comes from people thinking in us, them categories. I think the second cause of our national malaise, and really the other reason, I mentioned the personal reason I wrote the book, the social reason uh, is this. Um, there's something weird going on with our social fabric. Uh, if you look at the rising mental health costs, 30% uh, rise in depression, the number of Americans who say they have no close personal friends has gone up by four times since 2000. Uh, the number of Americans who rate themselves in the lowest happiness category is up by 50%. The number of Americans without a romantic partner is up by a third. The number of high school students who say they're persistently hopeless and despondent uh, is 45%. And so the, our society is just fraying at the relational level. And so we evolved to live in bands with 150 people where we're all looking out for each other. And when you feel invisible and unseen, you feel existentially unsafe because you are. It's, a, it's an insult. To, there's nothing crueler than you can do to, to, than not recognize somebody and to uh, say, you don't count, you don't matter, you're not here. And when people feel that way, they lash out. And one of the ways they lash out is through politics. Politics is a form of social therapy which does not solve the problem it's trying to solve. So the problem is loneliness and isolation. And politics gives you the illusion that you're in a community, you're on Team Red or Team Blue. Politics gives the illusion you're, there's a moral landscape here. There's the good guys, which is us, and then the bad guys over there. Politics gives you the illusion you're taking some moral action to make life better. Uh, but all you're doing is getting indignant uh, and hating another group. And so politics has become this unsuccessful for social therapy that's meant to cause loneliness. And lonely people are seven times more likely than non-lonely people to volunteer and do political action. And so our whole world has gotten over-politicized and under-moralized. We talk a lot about various partisan issues, but the things that really matter of how you build a relationship or whether you're courageous or honorable or capable of great love, we don't talk about those things as much. And we've become uh, a divided and bitter society uh, because of that. And the book is meant to be like a small way to say the most effective way to fight back against all this 
is to lead with trust, it's to lead with curiosity, it's to build connection, uh, and it's not naive and woo-woo to lead with trust. Uh, most of the time, uh, the other person will, will trust you back. Most of the time will live up to your trust and earn your trust. You'll be betrayed a lot of the time, but not most of the time. And so this is meant to be an aggressively effective way to fight back against what has, can only be described as social decay. David, you coined the phrase conflict entrepreneur, first time I'd heard that, and that there's a cottage industry developing out there, people making money on that. For those that are conflict entrepreneurs but don't know it, say someone like me who's not monetized that as a business, how do you know if you are a conflict entrepreneur and you don't want to be one? Are there some signs or there are some, some tips you might give Scott Miller on how to stop being a conflict entrepreneur? That's not my business. I'm not monetizing it, but I'm creating that. How do we know it and what do we do about it in our yeah. own lives? Well, first, are you using us them categories? Uh, are you dividing the world between the good guys and the bad guys? Do you think you're innocent and the other side is, is guilty? Uh, do you try to motivate people through the use of fear and anger? And this has unfortunately been part of my business. We've learned in the media that you, really, you can really attract eyeballs by trying to make people angry and fearful. And so the number of headlines over the last decade or so that try to generate anger and fear is up by 150%. And so we're, I mean, I'm in the media business, we're, we're sometimes guilty of this. Um, I would say the way out of it is to really try to understand the people you disagree with most. And the people you disagree with most are humans. And do you really understand them? And so sometimes somebody will come at me with criticism because they don't like my politics or there's some difference we're trying to cross, a, a ethnic difference, a racial difference, a class difference. And they're coming at me with an attack, with criticism. And so my instinct is to get all defensive and say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm one of the good guys here, or you don't know what I'm dealing with. But I've learned when somebody comes at you with critique and say you're managing an organization and people at the lower level of an organization are coming at you and they think you're doing something wrong, I think the first thing you can do and the best thing to do is stand in their standpoint. It's to ask them three or four or five times in different ways, tell me more about your point of view. What am I missing here? The Scottish have a word called ken, which is a naval term for the part of the water you can see from wherever you're on the boat. We, have, we understand the, the expression, that's beyond my ken. And so your job is to get inside their ken, to get inside their standpoint and see a little how they see the world. And you may never come to agree with them, but you will at least show them respect. And there's a great book I, I really admire called Crucial Conversations by a guy named Joseph Granny and a bunch of other people. Uh, and one of the things the authors say in that book is in any conversation, respect is like air. That when it's present, nobody notices. But when it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. And so in a lot of our hard conversations, respect is absent. In a lot of our hard conversations, we're, under, we're misunderstanding the crucial part of the conversation. There's the part we're nominally talking about, the, the subject of our conversation. But the real conversation is the flow of emotion that's becoming, going between us as we talk. With each thing I'm saying, I'm either making you feel more safe or less safe, more respected, less respected. Uh, and if the conversation's going south, then it doesn't matter what we're talking about. Our motivations have deteriorated. We're no longer fighting about a marketing plan or whatever. We're f I'm, I'm trying to say I'm smarter than you, I'm more powerful than you, I'm better than you. And at that point, my motivations have deteriorated. And anything I say after that, after I've lost my motivations, will be destructive to our relationship. And so the smart thing to do is when you see your motivations deteriorating in a hard meeting is to stop. It's just to stop talking uh, and, you know, go to bed. They, you know, they say never go to get ma bed mad with your spouse. Well, sometimes you just have to go to bed. So go to bed, get some sleep and try to restart the conversation at some future point. Uh, and so those are some of the things I've learned about how to have hard conversations across political, across business differences, across differences of opinion, any kind of difference and across inequality. David, how has writing this book changed you? Uh, in some material ways, like uh, I was used to be the guy who, um, if you saw me on a plane or a train or a bus, I had headphones in and I was on my screen. Uh, and now I'm more likely to, to talk to strangers. And I will say, life is way better. People are more interesting than anything I'm going to read on my screen. And so I, I just have much more fun with it, uh, getting to know people. 
Uh, finally, I'm just, I think I'm better at, at taking um, mediocre conversations and turning them into good conversations and memorable conversations. And I do that by asking the right questions. And so when I'm just getting to know someone, I don't ask deep questions. It's like, where are you from? I, I like to know where people are from. I like to get people talking about their childhood. People like talking about their childhood. And you learn a lot about people. But when I really get to know someone, if there's been trust, I try to have our conversations be memorable. And so I'll ask, if this five years is a chapter in your life, what's the chapter about? And that, that generates a meaningful conversation. Or uh, how do your ancestors show up in your life? I asked that at a dinner party, and there was a Dutch couple that talked about their Dutch heritage. There was a black couple that talked about African-American heritage. I talked about 5,000 years of Jewish history and how it's, I think it's changed me and shaped me. Uh, another was, if, if we met in a year, uh, what would we be celebrating? Hmm. Or another uh, is, uh, what commitment have you made you no longer believe in? Or finally, uh, what talent are you not yet using? What talent do you possess that you're, you're not taking full advantage of? And these are all questions that they don't have easy answers, but you begin an exploration. And then over the course of a conversation, you think, you know, it's kind of like this or it's kind of like that. And then we build. And a, con a good conversation is not two people making statements at each other. That's a bad conversation. A good conversation starts one place and ends somewhere else. We've gone together on a joint process of discovery. And we'll remember some of those conversations for months and years and maybe forever. Before you go to a dinner party, before you go to a barbecue, before you go to Christmas dinner with your family, before you have a one-on-one -on -one with your colleagues, before you go to a trade show and work the booth for your company, before you have your next interaction with someone in your life you know or do not know, you need to buy and absorb David Brooks' most recent book, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply, and being deeply seen. David, as we end our conversation, what's next for you? Uh, I get to go to the University of Michigan tomorrow where I'm giving a commencement address uh, for young students. And I always flatter myself when I give a commencement that they're gonna remember something I said, but that may not be true. But, <laughs> but I, I find it fun to be part of, commencements and graduation ceremonies are just happy occasions. So for me, it's, it's fun to be part of that. Fantastic, sir. We appreciate you taking time today prior to your flight. And your book uh, deserves all the accolades and bestseller status it's getting. I'm still, uh, uh, still buying copies and wrapping them for holiday gifts for family and friends, including my father-in-law. Thanks for your time today, sir. Happy holidays to you. Oh, it's been an honor and fun. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Mm -hmm.